Science and Human Origins, Chapter 2, Darwin's Little Engine That Couldn't. We've been going through the book Science and Human Origins now. Um, we're into Chapter 2. It's a book written by Ann Gauger, uh, Douglas Axe, and Casey Luskin, and put out by the Discovery Institute Press. first chapter was Science and Human Origins, and um, the second chapter that we're discussing now is Darwin's Little Engine That Couldn't. And at first I thought it was just a rehash of chapter one, but it turns out there are some important uh, information that was not included in chapter one that I think uh, you'll find fascinating. Then uh, we'll talk about human origins in the fossil record, all those uh, skulls and whatnot that uh, we're supposed to be looking at. Um, Francis Collins, Junk DNA and Chromosomal Fusion, so we'll get into some of the uh, uh, the, uh, the DNA record. And then finally finish up with the Science of Adam and Eve, which is a particularly fascinating chapter. Um, at the end of the book, there's a uh, section on authors and uh, on Douglas Axe. This is what it says. Douglas Axe is director of the Biologic Institute. It's a research organization that develops and makes and tests a scientific case for intelligent design and biology and explores its scientific implications. Dr. Axe's research uses both experiments and computer simulations to examine the functional and structural constraints on the evolution of proteins and protein systems. He's a no slouch. He got his PhD from Caltech and uh, then has been at Cambridge since then doing several um, uh, research projects. And his, book, his work has been reviewed in Nature and published in several peer reviewed scientific journals, which of course gives a lie to the idea that uh, intelligent design isn't in the peer reviewed literature. The uh, first little kind of almost theme paragraph you'd say is in Darwin's Little Engine That Couldn't is when it comes to producing major innovations in the history of life, like human beings. Darwin's engine of natural selection acting on random variations has proved to be the little engine that couldn't. Certainly not in the time allowed by most scientists. Probably not even in trillions of years. And uh, he begins the chapter, biologist Richard Dawkins, a vocal atheist, once described biology as a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. And that's, of course, from the Blind Watchmaker, page one. According to him, that appearance is entirely deceptive. Life needed no personal inventor because there is an impersonal one powerful enough to do the job, namely natural selection, the blind, unconscious, automatic process which Darwin discovered and which we now know is the explanation for the existence and apparently purposeful form of all life, which of course is again from the blind watchmaker. And that includes us. The evidence has convinced Douglas Axe otherwise. This engine of invention that Darwin imagined and Dawkins has spent much of his life promoting doesn't actually work very well when you put it to the test. He knows this because he's been in, uh, doing just that for a number of years, along with several of his colleagues. The result of their work has been described in technical detail. In fact, recognizing that the level of detail in those descriptions is far beyond what non-scientists are looking for, he's going to try to focus on the bigger picture and describe it in plain English. The question of how humans came to be and this is the Reader's Digest version. I've tried to omit everything that I reasonably could so that uh, we could get through it in time to actually talk about it. Is deeply connected with how we, sh we should think of ourselves. This place is it among the most important subjects of human inquiry through the ages. Everyone perceives this, but when it comes to evaluating the science that gets, down, uh, gets drawn on to making arguments on this important topic, most people find themselves in the difficult position of having to judge a debate without speaking the language of the debaters. 
To add to the difficulty, the debaters themselves can be so emphatic and dogmatic that it seems as though something other than scientific data must be animating the exchange. And I would have to second that point. The good news is that the situation is not as hopeless as it might look. If careful observation and reasoning have anything decisive to say about our origin, then science provides a way forward. Now, by that, that does not mean any particular scientific authority or organization or committee or publication, but rather science itself. Science, as he's defining it, has always progressed by the conflict ideas and whatever benefits some of those ideas have received from things other than the twin pillars of observation and reasoning, those pillars alone, observation and reasoning, will remain standing in the end. Every conclusion they don't support will fall, eventually. It may take a while. With that in mind, his purpose is to present a key part of the scientific case against Darwinism in terms that everyone can follow, and to tie that case to the great question of, his, of our own origin as humans. The best arguments are simple, so the very exercise of distilling an argument to its essence is, in his opinion, and mine also, the best way for someone who labors over the technical details to stay, step back and see whether anything good has come of it. And he believes, and I think we'll see, that it has. That careful science now stands decisively against Darwinism. But he's going to allow you room to make up your own mind. His aim is to equip you to decide for yourself. Don't take his word for it. Darwin's little engine. He and Anne Gauger have recently challenged Darwin's engine to invent something so much simpler than humanity that the comparison may seem rather odd. And yet there is an important connection between what they examined and human origins. The technical details of their study are available for those who may want to examine them, and we'll give that in the next slide. But all you need to know to follow what he's saying is that each gene inside a cell carries the instructions for building a particular protein. And each protein is a tiny machine-like device that carries out one of the many tasks that must be accomplished for the cell to function properly. And there is the reference, and uh, um, this is as much for the people who will view this on the internet as anything else. The uh, reference, you can get that uh, article free if you want to. And he's going to show a figure which we'll show in the next slide, uh, which is a modest test that Darwin's engine failed. The object that will be on the left is the depiction of the protein that they started with, and the one on the right is the protein that performs the desired new function. And they weren't asking whether it would be exactly uh, converted entirely to the thing on the right. They were just asking how many changes it takes to change the function from one to the other. And that should be possible with only a partial shift in the appearance, which ought to be relatively easy in view of the close resemblance. And there's the picture. You can see the one on the left and the one on the right. The, the uh, shape of the coil is very similar between the two. There's just enough difference to where they ca catalyze two different reactions. And uh, here are the reactions that they catalyze. For those of you who are not biochemists and have no intention of being, you just close your eyes for about 30 seconds. And uh, the first one uh, takes this thing with uh, CoA on it and attaches it to alanine with a loss of carbon dioxide. And uh, when you get done with this, after about three or four more steps, uh, you turn it into this compound down here, biotin. This COH wiggle is the COH up here. The other one takes glycine and acetyl-CoA and turns it into the immediate precursor of threonine, that amino acid here, which is flipped compared with what you see there. The carboxyl group is there. And this gets reduced from a ketone 
to an alcohol. Now, the big similarity is perhaps obscured by all this stuff because this COA here and this COA here are a big, long molecule that looks like that. That's uh, coenzyme A. In those simple terms, all we did was ask whether Darwin's engine can alter a single gene in bacterial cells so that its instructions specify a modified version of the original protein that performs a new task. We wanted this to work, so we bent over backwards to choose a pair of tasks that ought to make this conversion relatively easy. In terms of more familiar objects, you can think of our test as being like taking a putter from a golf bag and asking something, some process, to reshape it to work as a pitching wedge. This is a real change in function, but not the fantastical kind that would be needed to get the wedge from a completely different object like, for example, a corkscrew or halogen lamp. Well, if the process in this example involved a talented metal worker, then success is virtually guaranteed. But can something as simple and clueless as Darwin's engine really do anything co comparable? Comparable. And let's go back here and look and notice that the mutations that are needed are greater than seven to fix the core. That's not to fix all of the other stuff uh, or make it do the job well. That's just to get it to do the job initially. And the time needed has been calculated at uh, trillions of trillions of years. <coughs> Apparently not, according to the results of their experiment. Darwin's engine proved to be the little engine that couldn't, certainly not in the few billion years at which it is supposed to have done everything and probably not in a few trillion years. So what does this have to do with our own origin? The answer is that it places an important limitation on what we can infer from similarity. Specifically, we now know that we can't infer that Darwin's engine can produce thing a, B from thing A simply because A and B are quite similar, which is a common argument. We know this because we have shown for a particular thing A and a similar thing B that his engine can't accomplish a transformation, not directly anyway, and he'll discuss more about that later. The failure of Darwin's engine in this case is its downfall precisely because we asked it to prove its most highly touted credentials, its credentials as an inventor. It will be helpful to summarize our result in the form of a principle as follows. Darwinian transitions from A to B that accomplish invention cannot be presumed plausible simply because A and B are substantially similar. Now, it doesn't say that all Darwinian transitions are implausible, like the one we studied. It simply says that their plausibility can't be counted on just because they end with something similar to what they started with. You have to have more evidence than that. Simple though this is, this principle turns out to have enormous implications for Darwinism. To fully grasp them, you have to understand how central the concept of similarity has become to evolutionary reasoning. Since evolutionary biologists assume that Darwin's engine is capable of inventing everything that has been invented in the living world, their interest lies in the historical particulars of the engine's activity. All that remains for today's evolutionary biologists is the business of inferring the details of the great family tree. And for this, they need only continue the pursuit of methods for detecting the increasingly faint similarities left behind by increasingly distant familial relationships. And I'm, again, I'm skipping um, pieces. That turns out to be precarious reasoning. If we have reason to think that Darwin's engine wasn't the great inventor, then the sense in which one species is related to the next must remain an open question until we settle the matter of the fundamental nature of the inventive process. As things now stand, 
are finding that a particular evolutionary transition between two very similar things is beyond the reach of Darwin's engine, severely undermines the logic of similarity that has underwritten the entire Darwinian tree project. A mental picture may help to clarify what went wrong. Darwinian evolution is often thought of in terms of journeys over a vast, rugged landscape where sideways distance is uh, how much change you have to make, and vertical distance is how fit the object is to live. Each point on this strange terrain represents a possible genome sequence, these possibilities being so staggeringly numerous that real organisms have only actualized a minute fraction of them. The ground elevation at each point corresponds to the fitness of individuals carrying that genome, with the horizontal distance between any two points indicating the degree to, to which the corresponding genomes differ. In terms of this picture, all of the millions of species alive today are represented by their own points, high up on peaks, scattered somewhere across this conceptual landscape. The fact that they're alive demonstrates the quality of their genomes. Now, whenever a species happens to be wherever it happens to be, Darwin's engine tends to move it towards the highest ground it can reach. And we'll should see that figure in just a minute. According to the Darwinian story, that simple tendency to migrate upward has, for billions of years, transported the first prim primitive genome from its starting point to higher points along millions of diverging paths. The result is the spectacular variety of life forms we see today with the correspondingly wide dispersal of genomes across the vast conceptual landscape. And there's the figure that he's talking about, where um, this is just a part of the landscape. And if a, an ancestral species started where there's an upslope to two other species, then some of the ancestral species will start climbing the slope this way, and others of it will start climbing the slope that way. But there's something suspicious about this story. As a number of careful observers pointed out long before uh, Dr. Gauger and uh, Dr. Axe did their experiment, and uh, his references to the Wistar Institute uh, mathematical challenge, it has to do with the wide disparity of distance scales. The scale of the landscape, which is characterized by the extent to which dissimilar genomes differ, is very large by any reasonable calculation. On the other hand, Darwin's engine moves in steps that can only reach points a tiny distance away from the prior point. In one step, it can move a genome to the highest point within this reach, but further progress would require a still higher point to fall within reach once that move is made. There has to be, a, each, one ha, uh, each little step has to be advantageous. Um, as it turns out for bacteria, there's a plane that uh, you can wander about six in any direction. Uh, seven is outside of the range. Six is hard, but could be done. Um, two or three can be done fairly easily. Uh, you can watch that happen in, in the laboratory. Uh, just a minute. Go ahead. I mean, theoretically, it's possible to take huge leaps across sequence space with, uh, you know, um, just changing a, a character on the typewriter, you can change everything after that spot and uh, take a giant leap across. You mean space. by frame shift type yeah, mutations? Yeah, frame shift mutations. Um, but it would take a specific frame shift that was aimed in a particular direction. Uh, you right, it doesn't really help the odds, but just to say that you can only take a tiny step around your original starting point isn't exactly true. Well, I mean, it doesn't really help to solve the problem, but it is true that you can take a huge leap in sequence space. You can. Uh, the thing of it is, that you, you also have to, you also have to watch out for uh, the frame shifts that don't run you into stop codons. Right. I'm just saying, and theoretically, that, and that it's it's run you into something useful. So, I'm it's, not saying it's that like the odds are there. I'm just saying it's theoretically right, possible. Right. It is theoretically possible, uh, but it's theoretically possible that with just plain luck you could go seven in a row in one particular direction, too. Right. Uh, it's just not something that you'd bet on during the lifetime of this planet. That might happen every now and then, but it would have to happen in an amazingly consistent and helpful way 
to explain how the enormous distances were traversed from the point marking the first primitive organism to the millions of points marking the great variety of modern life forms. And uh, this is uh, the revised figure two, um, which shows the problem of climbing in very tiny steps. And uh, you see, if, if you magnify this to a large degree and you find that there are in fact peaks here, then it's not going to climb back down and stay there for any period of time. It'll tend, this, this area will tend to swamp that, and then this nice smooth climb that we were hoping to do to the new species will get hung up right next to the ancestral species. That's the problem. Let's put this in more familiar terms. The summit of Mount Whitney, the highest point in the contiguous United States, is just 136 kilometers from the lowest point in North America, which is known as Badwater Basin. Now, supposing there were an automated vehicle capable of remotely scanning the surrounding terrain within some fixed distance and then moving to the highest point identified by the scan. If the scan radius is 136 kilometers or greater, then it can just say, oh, there's Mount Whitney, that's where I'm headed. You could get from Badwater to Whitney in one scan and move operation. But what if the scan radius is one millionth of that size? That you're, now the v circle that the vehicle sees from its current position is about a shoe length across, about a foot, with each move being up to half that distance. Considering how uneven the ground is, we wouldn't expect this nearsighted vehicle to go more than about well, a few scan and move operations before finding a rock and getting stuck on the top and not moving. Maybe half a pace from where it started. Summoning Whitney would be completely out of the question. So the idea that any ability to seek higher ground, no matter how restricted, makes the highest summit accessible, turns out to be highly simplistic. Now, interestingly, even if you are doing a road, if the road has any down dips anywhere, then you're going to be stuck on that high point there. It would take a very special road that had no down dips whatsoever on the way up to Whitney. The very same critique applies to Darwinism. Consider that for Darwin's engine to invent humans from apes, it would have, have to work within the severe limitations for a single mutation scan radius. And uh, some people are saying, that single mutation? Well, actually, it's very simple. There's an article that says waiting for two mutations, and it gives, the, for humans, about 140 million years for two mutations to take place. That's probably an underestimate. Uh, we'll discuss this uh, another time because it's interesting. They're fighting um, Michael Behe in their uh, article. And they're saying it isn't nearly as long as Michael Behe said. It's much shorter than that. It's only 140 million years. Problem is, for humans and apes, you only got six million years. Maybe five, maybe seven. But that's where you're stuck. That is, it would have to invent humans one simple mutation at a time, with each of these mutations making its possessors significantly more fit than their peers. Because wandering for two mutations before you pick up a, a new one is just, it takes too long. Contrast this single mutation reach with the millions of differences that distinguish the chimp and human genomes, and we're back to the impossible trek from Badwater to Whitney. Maybe the genomic landscape is so much simpler and smoother than Death Valley terrain as to enable Darwin's engine to cruise upward to exotic destinations on gentle inclines. But why would anyone assume this to be so? Only if experiment after experiment were to prove that remarkable kind of terrain to be the rule, should anyone begin to think of so that something so fantastic might be true. Alas, the experiments that we performed is one of many that have examined precisely this point, and the clear consensus is that the landscape is anything but smooth and gentle. In fact, Darwin's engine often moves away from invention in its short-sighted pursuit of immediate fitness gain. Yes, Sean? 
it's even worse than that. Uh, he doesn't talk about levels of complexity. It's, it's uneven and very rough, even at low levels of complexity. But as you get higher and higher on the, on the scale of complexity, it gets even more rough, exponentially more rough. Well, he's making it easy and simple and uh, understated, I think. Yeah, well, very understated. <laughs> anyway, there's actually a reference for that where people have tested what happens most of the time. Uh, there have been other observations, including Behe's article that we discussed before. The first rule is to break something. That's the easiest way to make uh, a, uh, an organism more fit in a very unusual environment. And of course, that's why cave fish go blind. The eyes are in there are a detriment rather than a help, and so if you remove them, you're actually better off. Experiments will continue to add to this picture, of course. Darwin's engine can't drive the shortest distance from A to B in our test case, but perhaps an even smaller test will be found, and perhaps the engine will pass that test. And in fact, we discussed in an article where um, they were able to replace four uh, RNA residues in a, um, in a virus. It took an awful lot of prodding, but you can do it for very, very short distances. And uh, for that matter, maybe a new protein will eventually be found that sits between our A and B, enabling the engine to traverse paths that connect A and B through that middle point. And that's what he was talking about. We'll talk about this later. Um, but at present, we don't know of any such protein. And the argument that there must be such a protein is basically a faith-based argument. The important thing to realize, though, is that this wouldn't remove the problem of this disparity of scales. It is now clear that Darwin's engine can't climb a peak corresponding to a new invention unless that peak happens to be remarkably close to its current location. Closer than the peak-to-peak -peak distances between any pair of proteins that we know of with distinct uh, functions. Even if such an extraordinary case were to be found, it would be just that, an extraordinary case. Traversing long distances would still depend on a very long and well-coordinated succession of extraordinary cases, which amounts to nothing short of a miracle. In fact, in his uh, effort to simplify, he's downplayed how extraordinary this would be. Darwin's engine actually received much more sympathetic treatment in their experiment than it would in nature. It was just, I think, your point. In terms of the landscape picture, that means that the nearby peak we challenged Darwin's engine to climb would actually be much more distant in any realistic scenario. When it comes to human origins, all I would add is that the inadequacy of Darwin's engine must surely become even more profound as the inventions attributed to it become more profound. Humans brought the products of their own contemplation music and drama and literature and painting and sculpture and philosophy and theology and mathematics and science and technology and athletics and culture and movements and politics and war, none of which are particular fortes of chimps. The best of good mixed with the worst of bad, all of it category, uh, categorically unlike what came before. So if this humanity thing is on a level of its own, how reasonable do you suppose it is to talk it up to Darwin's little engine? To insist that it, on that is to ignore the evidence. A comparison of the complete human and chimp genomes has identified 20 distinct gene families. That's not 20 distinct genes. That's 20 distinct gene families of groups of genes that look like each other that don't look like anything else that are present in humans but absent from chimps and other mammals. Yes, and that's a reference for that, and we're going to look at that reference because that is so astounding. That is a huge gap when you compare it to the single in-family gene transition that we were examining. Scientists who insist that Darwin got our story, the human story, right, 
Have they thought seriously about what an ape to human transition would detail? Well, first of all, you'd have to wire a brain for speech, and the intelligence needed to make use of speech. Then you have to configure the lips, the tongue, the vocal cra uh, tract. Then you have to co coordinate all those inventions with all the changes needed for females to bring forth a bigger brain to offspring. Then once you got done with that, you've got to figure out how to do that, uh, how to program that into the DNA. And then you have to identify a series of single mutations that each one of which is better than the last one that would orchestrate this whole inventive process. They may think that they know some of the answers to these problems, and that's a start, but have they gone into the primate lab and done the work that should convince those of us who wonder whether they have it all right? Have they been hard at work for decades quietly validating their ideas by producing talking chimps? That's, of course, ignoring the uh, ethical issues involved. If so, have they done the experiments to measure the fitness effect of each single mutation along the line of chimps that eventually produce the ones that talk? Did they verify that each increases the fitness enough to become established in a natural population? And assuming they've checked all the boxes to this point, did they do the math to verify that the whole transition can happen naturally in an ape population within a few hundred thousand generations? I think the answer to that is pretty obvious. Doug's point is simply that virtually everything that would need to be done to establish the sheer physical possibility of turning apes into humans remains undone. A closing thought, as someone who loves science, I, Doug, has to have to say that I think of no conclusion in the whole history of the discipline that is so firm and so profound and so original that it should cause every human being to stop and rethink what it means to be human. Most simply aren't that profound. I happen to think that Darwin's was that profound, but thankfully also profoundly wrong. Now, we're going to look at that article a little bit more. It is stunning. Let's just um, give you the, um, uh, the abstract first. Uh, gene family is a group of homologous genes that are likely to have highly similar functions. Now you know what a gene family is. The differences in family size due to lineage-specific gene duplication and gene loss may provide clues to the evolutionary forces that have shaped mammalian genomes. These guys that are writing this are clearly, uh, if not evolutionists themselves, certainly um, um, uh, willing to talk the talk of evolutionary biologists, and from the sound of it, probably are. Here, the people who wrote the, the uh, article analyze the gene families contained within the whole genome of human, chimpanzee, mouse, and rat. In total, we find that more than half of the 9,990 families present, present in the mammalian common ancestor have either expanded or contracted along at least one lineage. That means about 5,000. Additionally, and it's probably more than that because they've, uh, in the article, they only a analyzed uh, rat, mouse, dog, human, and chimpanzee. Additionally, they find that um, large number of families are completely lost from one or more mammalian genomes, and a similar number of gene families have arisen subsequent to the mammalian common ancestor. So you're talking about whole gene families. Along the lineage leading to modern humans, they infer the gain of 689 genes and the loss of 86 genes since the split from chimpanzees. 689 genes, including changes likely driven by adaptive natural selection. Now, many of these genes are similar to other genes, and so maybe you could duplicate the genes, mutate them a little bit, and then get the gene you want. But some of them are from whole new families. The results imply that humans and chimpanzees differ by at least 6%. Uh, notice that that's considerably more than the standard 1.5% that you hear about. 
This genomic revolving door of gene gain and loss represents a large number of uh, genetic differences separating humans from our, from our closest relatives. Now, this is kind of interesting because in this paragraph you will notice that there's several families with larger than expected changes and they specifically include expansions in the human lineage for families with brain specific functions. So our brains are different from chimpanzees and there's a genetic bas basis for that. And additionally, they find that the total number of gene differences between humans and chimps estimated by their method is similar to that predicted from independent analysis. In other words, the 6% is actually not that unstandard. The 1.5% is a myth that has been perpetuated. 1%, 2% is bunk. And it's being kept going because of ideological reasons, if I can say it that way. People who really know, know better. Along the lineage leading to humans, 414 families have expanded and 86 have contracted. And there's a table, which I'll show you briefly. Uh, these changes have accounted for the gain of 689 genes, loss of 86 genes. And the chimpanzees have experienced expansions in only 25 families, which is kind of interesting, and contractions in 546 families. So the chimpanzees are actually less than the average mammal. If you wanted to make a case, you could say that chimpanzees are degenerate rather than th that they're rather than they're just standard uh, 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 mammals. And this is kind of interesting. <laughs> they call this table one creations. Ah, uh, how did how that passed the uh, censors? I don't know. Or why that was thought of is pretty obvious because it looks like a creation. Of course, uh, created by Darwin's little engine that can only in humans do one mutation or at a time. It takes incredible luck to get two. Um, but, uh, how, how do you sense contractions? Uh, well, okay. An addition is one which, let's say, only humans have. Chimps don't have it, rats don't have it, mice don't have it, dogs don't have it. So apparently the common ancestor probably didn't have it, and this is a new family. Now, on the other hand, if dogs have it, and rats have it, and mice have it, and humans have it, but not chimpanzees, that's a contraction. Oh, so it's comparative between <laughs> these species as according to an evolutionary uh, way, track, or whatever? Yeah. So, okay. Notice that the contractions are, uh, the, the largest fraction of additions are in both humans and chimpanzees. It'd be fascinating to know whether gorillas and orangutans had them. Um, but the statistics, they didn't give those. Where there's a whole uh, 1,730 families of genes containing 2,278 genes themselves. And then, the, of course, the additional 20 families considering, uh, uh, containing greater than one gene found only in the human genome and two only found in the chimpanzee genome. So and there's the table one up here and table two down here. Uh, pardon me? We're talking about protein carrying genes. Yes, that's correct. Uh, yeah. Well, of course, there's that whole debate on what you call a gene. Um, but I think you know, these there's people. A, there's an additional 8% of non coding DNA, microRNAs, and such, that are unique to humans as well. And a large number of them have to deal with brain development also. Uh, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. But the point of it is, the tip is huge. You have to think about how much more there is. You know, I mean, look at this. 
primates have special ones, a whole bunch of special ones. And then humans have a bunch more piled on top of them. You try to think of a, of a process that would give you one new, brand new gene. And, and what it's saying is there are 20 of them. And they all arose in the last five million years by a species that probably had, what, 10,000, 100,000 population at most. Um, uh, there just isn't enough time to both mutate them and then test all the mutations and keep the good ones. There just isn't. This article, by the way, if you get curious, you can uh, look it up. Those of you who get the email, uh, it's the last reference on the uh, some references. Um, you just click on it and you can get there. Those of you who don't get the email, uh, email uh, faithscienceSS at, uh, at gmail.com and uh, we'll put you on the email. I've done that already. Our results indicate that the human genome contains 1,418 genes, that's 6.4% of all genes, that do not have orthologs in the chimpanzee genome. If we inc include differences in the size of gene families that are unique to primates, such that we can't polarize them as gains or losses because you don't know whether the, ch the chimpanzee gained it or whether the or chimpanzee lost it or whether the human gained it, you've got an additional 566 genes as well. That's a lot of new genes. Now, as I read the chapter in um, uh, Science and Human Origins, uh, it seems to argue that difference is beyond a quite small limit, and they document what that limit is from the literature, a, a peer-reviewed literature and generally accepted. Um, one mutation without reinforcement by natural selection for humans and elephants and other large mammals that don't reproduce rapidly cannot be accounted for by neo-Darwinian neo processes. That limit has been massively surpassed. Whole gene families in the difference between apes and humans. And his argument, and I think it's a good one, is something other than neo-Darwinism is going on here. Does kind of raise that question of uh, biology is a study of complicated uh, uh, objects that look like they are, uh, they give the appearance of being designed for a purpose. And uh, maybe the appearance isn't that far off. Common design uh, descent, depending on how you define it, is not really what's being tested. Because, you know, if God guided mutations, then you could have a chimp bear, an ear chimp bear, or whatever, and God designed each one to, to go further. Um, once you have a designer in there, the designer can implement the design any way the designer wants to. That's within his skill level. And, of course, if it's God, the skill level is... Uh, uh, essentially not a limit. Um, so is that common descent? Well, that would be technically common descent, but it would not be the common descent that these people need. What is really being challenged is unguided evolution, which is required if there is no God and no other superintelligence. And the question that uh, I think comes to mind is, uh, do you have to make science safe for atheists? If not, maybe this is a point where it should be dangerous for atheists. Now, we can ask the question, does the existence of humans require intelligent design and make the argument, humans have certain differences from apes, these differences are beyond the reasonable ability of unguided evolution to create, and therefore, some other factor, probably intelligent design, is required. Um, the answer to that, of course, is, well, we're here, there is no intelligent designer, and therefore, unguided evolution must be able to create us. To say otherwise is to abandon reason and science. And that's an argument I get all the time.
but it assumes the conclusion. And if the conclusion is, has to be supported on its own weight, I think the conclusion falls flat. The other argument I get, though, is that uh, uh, we're here. We don't know what created us, but uh, we don't know all of, uh, it, even if it's not Darwinian's little engine, it must be some other natural engine that we haven't found yet. Yes, but you see, it's the same argument. There is no intelligent designer, right? So maybe it's not a Darwinian evolution, but it's some kind of evolution, right? That's the argument. And basically, it's, an argu it's a faith-based argument. I think Axe has done us a great favor by pointing out that the published, published estimates of unguided evolutionary rates of change are way too slow to account for massive documented changes in hominids, assuming the standard geologic time scale. Durrett and Schmidt for evolutionary reach in large mammals. Um, Behe before them for, uh, before them for go goading them into admitting the obvious, even though they don't go as far as Behe does. And um, DeMuth et al. for the massive changes between chimps and humans, which I don't think are, are adequately, appropriate, uh, adequately known. And I think they deserve to be wider spread. The, the genome changes between humans and chimps in coding sections. You know, the other ones you can argue about uh, how much influence they are, although I think after ENCODE, that argument is being lost. Uh, but we're talking, we're talking classic genes now, protein coding sequences, whole new families coming up that nobody had any clue about because they were busy looking for similarities instead of differences. Well, it's your turn to comment, ask questions. Uh, just one little comment about definition. Uh, uh, it seems to me that this hits a little bit beyond unguided evolution. Uh, and doesn't accommodate very well guided evolution. Of course, when you look at the fossil record, uh, you don't get the picture of guided evolution because of the big gaps between uh, basic fossil types and so on. So that it, it uh, not only hits on guided evolution, it hits evolution as a whole. Uh, in one sense, uh, you could probably do something like, uh, uh, like a super accelerated um, uh, without any intermediates. Uh, with with this is creation. With only with only like two or three intermediates yeah. that you know. You make a big hop to one. You make a big hop to another, yeah. and it's still a monkey that who's the great grand father or mother of, of, uh, mm. of the human that comes through, well, we, an ape. We need to define the terms, but this could be called progressive creation. Uh, uh, I agree. I think, that, I think that it really makes it hard to ex not accept either old age or, or short age creation. I think it really does. For lack of someone else, I'll think I'm a little aloud here. As you were talking, I was thinking of the difference between a chimpanzee and myself. But I've also been told that I have some Neanderthal DNA in my makeup and that there were other homo species. Could there not have been a little more cooperation between some of these now extinct uh, species and uh, the genome of apes? Um, Neanderthals may very well be humans with neoteny, uh, which means they retain infantile uh, characteristics as they get older, um, making it actually believable that people got married at 65 instead of at uh, at uh, age 15 or 20, 
as would be more common for uh, humans that don't have uh, societal pressures on them. Um, and uh, that apparently live to very long ages. I don't, I rather suspect that Neanderthals are simply humans. Uh, humans as they were intended to be before uh, more degeneration took place. Keep in mind that Neanderthals have approximately 10% or so higher cranial capacity than the average human does. In other words, if size means anything in that area, they were smarter. They were also stronger, they could run farther, they had occipital buns, which we don't have. They're just a different ethnic variation. They were uglier. They were uglier, yeah. Well, we are good looking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, to, to be smarter and to run faster and to be stronger, uh, I'd take looking a little uglier. <laughs> How, how many, just a quick survey, how many of you had heard that we had 20 new gene families? One. And that's because you're a specialist in the literature, right? Uh, this is not something that is out there, and it's something that should be out there. Last week I read Genetic Entropy by John Sanford. It's a very convincing book, if you can understand it. It's a little complex for my simple mind. However, he says that there are no positive genetic mutations which, are, which lie in the range of even being selectable. That the noise of all the negative genetic mutations, which are so infinitesimally small as to be unselectable, are also, you know, cover up any positives and that they are truly unselectable. Genetic change doesn't occur one gene at a time anyway. It occurs with a whole cluster of genes to make it possible. So the genetic change that happens at one level, at one gene at a time, is just pointless, absolutely pointless when it comes to any kind of positive change. You know, that's the other point that we have, we have not even touched is what do you do with all the damaging mutations while you're trying to get these ones that will f slowly advance you one little tiny step at yeah, a time. That, if that's not the nail in the coffin, I mean, even if you do get a positive mutation, which happens rarely, occasionally you get a positive mutation, but Sanford's point is that so what? You got 10,000 negative ones at the same time. Exactly. So you're going downhill anyway with your little positive mutation. Especially in, so, I mean, it's different for bacteria, which is a lot of the research is talking about bacteria, which the, de the negative mutations uh, can be overcome because of the, the very high reproductive rate. But when you're talking humans and apes and elephants and chimps and all that, then that, there's no way it's to overcome. Ridiculous. We cannot reproduce nearly fast enough to exactly. overcome. Even bacteria, as soon as these supposedly positive mutations occur, they rapidly reverse back to the way they were. If there's a change in environment, yeah. they do. Yeah. No, Sanford is just uh, one more, one more uh, is the icing on the cake of this one. What it's saying is that you've got this massive current and so you manage to climb one step ahead in the flow, the, the, whole, the whole flow is going down the wrong way. And in fact, his argument, I think, is a good argument not only for creation to begin with, because you can't get there by small evolutionary steps, but his argument is a good one for saying, and it's not been millions of years. Oh, but he says even the smallest change takes so... He says even the smallest change would take so many years beyond what they estimate that it actually took, that it's just... Impossible, absolutely impossible. Sanford's That's argument what you goes said against. Uh, Sanford's argument goes against the uh, slow creation or theistic evolution, because it says there's not enough time. He say he said we could not have been here more than a hundred thousand years. So, and, that, that's and a definitely it, a creationist argument. If if we've not been here over a hundred thousand years, then 
then this talk about millions of years of, of, of stasis is just uh, preposterous. Now, the, the thing I think is really important is that the, the biggest take home message is that we are no longer talking about, well, I think, or this kind of thing. We are now talking about hard theoretical limits to how fast things can rationally be assumed to mutate. And it's in the literature now. But that, that Douglas Axe has been in the literature for over 10 years now, but no one references him. And uh, I don't, you know, it's like, well, that's not published. And why don't you publish? I was like, I don't need to publish because Doug Axe already published it. And, and what do they say then? Well, uh, well never what, heard of him. What journal did he publish in? I mean, well. Biocomplexity. Yeah, it's, it's a regular journal. The amazing thing to me is that they seem to think that a man and a woman apparently were evolved at the same time so that they could mate. Even when you try to mate a tiger and a lion, they cannot produce offspring. They can, actually. It's a liger. Yes, I know. But it's tough. But, but, they, but those ligers cannot mate. They can. This ligers can mate and produce And viable. produce offspring? Yeah, they can. So but that only they, shows that lions and tigers are really the same gene pool. They're the same species, but we give them different species names, even though they really aren't, as far as, as, far as uh, biology is concerned. They're the same. They're just different expressions of different aspects of the same gene pool, just like different breeds of dogs. Exactly. Are, are, are part of the same gene pool. It's variation. It's right. The same thing with polar bears and, and grizzly bears. There's pizzly bears now. And they're, they're the same. They're the same gene pool. And even donkeys and horses that make mules. Well, you can argue, well, the mule's sterile, but it's still. You produced it from, the, from donkeys and horses, so they must be from the same original gene pool. The only reason mules are sterile is because there's been a genetic inversion between a horse and a donkey that makes it so that when meiosis happens in the mule, it gets all mixed up and they can't produce viable gametes. But it's still the same information is there. And so when the Bible talks about kinds, biblical kinds of animals, that's a better description, I think, than species because species is subjectively defined in literature. Right. But the amazing thing is even different varieties of birds don't intermate. Well, sometimes, well, unless you make them. Sometimes different birds that don't intermate naturally, if you put them in a lab and force them to intermate, or if you take the sperm from one and, and fertilize the That's egg. That's an intelligent mind <laughs> doing it. No, well, the, the egg will still produce, uh, it'll still make a bird. Uh, the, but even though the, maybe they think, maybe think the other bird family is ugly or something. You know, tigers, that's why they don't tigers intermate. and lions don't choose to mate. Maybe you can force them to. Well, maybe they don't do now, but I think originally they came, not, without, not by intelligent design, but originally they diverged from the same gene pool and formed families of lions and tigers, and now they think each other is ugly. So they don't mate. <laughs> but, no, that's, but that's maybe your explanation. My explanation is that God created them not to want to mate because he didn't want the species to be all confused. Well, not right? necessarily, because but, how, if you start talking about species, there's an argument that the current numbers of species that exist today could not have fit on Noah's Ark. But that's assuming that all the species that we define as species today really are. And I don't think so. I think that all the cats are from one animal, original pair, including house cats. Yeah. All cats are the same species. And, and all uh, you had to bring into the ark was right, one, one pair, one of, pair cats. of cats. And that's it. And that would have made but everything cats, you see today. Notice cats can choose to mate with other species of cats. Dogs choose to mate and very quickly change even the, the identifiable marks of a, spe of a certain kind of dog. They can change that. They can, but you know, modern dogs, like a domesticated dog, will not mate with a wolf uh, readily. They right. just won't choose to do that, even though right. we know that modern dogs came from the wolf. We know that, wolf. and without intelligent design, they just don't like to mate with each other anymore. And, and so then you can explain these things easier. Uh, just, just a comment on the other side of the scale. Uh, I can't give you the references. I wish I could there in my book, uh, Science Discovers God, but uh, there's been a serious consideration on the part of the scientific community as to how you're going to get the caterpillar to change into a butterfly. And the suggestion is that a caterpillar type organism mated with a butterfly type of organism. And I want to point out that this is not what we're talking about 
here a gene family, the same gene family. I mean, caterpillars are so very different than butterflies. There's no way this is the same gene family yet. Well, it raises a very interesting question. Where are there butterflies that don't have a larval stage? In order to get a butterfly to mate with a caterpillar, you'd have to have a butterfly that, that didn't have a larval stage, and then, it, and then they mixed them up. It doesn't work at all, but there's a whole book written about it. Uh, <laughs> this may be relevant. Uh, are any of you familiar with Lewis Thomas, who was dean at, what, Yale? Uh, um, I know the name. But he used to write little essays for New England Journal. Mm, not medically, but uh, he was considered a kind of a poet from the way he wrote his style. Uh, for many, many years, those of us who remember the New England Journal from way back, we remember his writing of, of essays, which were supposed to be diversional and entertaining as much as informative. But he was, of course, very strong on evolution. And um, it wasn't his theory, but he came up with it, and he put it in almost poetry in terms of the way he would describe it in um, his essays, that many of the traits of cells that would take many, many millions of years, as you would have been describing it, could have happened uh, almost much quicker, or at least the time frame would be compressed, uh, simply by one form just entering into the cell and staying there. In other words, the cilia that characterize very advanced cell cells were simply spirochetes that once existed separately in the swamp and instead of having to form all these intermediate genetic sub-things, the uh, spirochete just simply somehow or another got into one of those cells and stayed there. So you are leapfrogged all over, completely beyond these uh, mechanisms that you've been talking about. A mechanism may have re been responsible for the spirochete, but meanwhile it was also uh, there also existed a eukaryocyte that didn't have any nucleus, didn't have any cilia, and for this cell it was not necessary for a long, complicated transitional set of systems to develop, but simply for the spirochete to get in there and stay. You know, that's an interesting point because uh, more and more people are going to the idea of horizontal gene transfer which is basically what you're talking about. The DNA from the, for the cilium from, uh, uh, from a spirochete or perhaps from E. coli or you know, various other things that might have one. Uh, I guess E. coli mainly has flagella, if I remember correctly. But there are, there are ciliated organisms that could have, could have given us cilia uh, as a, an in-block thing. The problem that I see with that in it as a total explanation is we are now talking about 20 new human gene families that aren't found, as far as we know, in any other organism. Granted, we haven't looked for all the possible organisms there are, but it doesn't look very promising to find all of these brain-specific uh, proteins in some, some bacterium that doesn't have a brain. So uh, while I think that there's probably a lot of that going on, uh, I don't think it has the whole answer. And the other thing that's fascinating is horizontal gene transfer is absolutely indistinguishable from designed horizontal gene transfer. That is, God said, I need cilia in the paramecium, 
I need cilia in the human. We'll just make them uh, one a little bit different from the other so that it will be expressed at the appropriate time in the appropriate way. And uh, uh, it's a design, it's very much like you might say, well, I need a light switch in a house. I need a light switch in an airplane. We'll design the switch to be more or less the same. Um, and uh, it, it's interesting because creationists used to get hammered with the idea that, well, if God wanted to do all this stuff, why did he make it? Why didn't he just use the same thing in, in organism after organism after organism? Why do you have to use different proteins all the time? Well, it turns out he doesn't. And that particular argument mm -hmm. falls flat on its face. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, to add a dimension to that, facetiously almost, you can state, uh, transfer all the genes you want to, how are you going to originate those genes to start out with? But now what you're saying is that, well, then you still need a creator for the paramecium or wherever the psyllium came from. In terms of ultimate origins, you're going to have to have a very astute design. No question. I was just thinking about a question here, you know, as far as a class like this, you know, your class, which has an interest in this direction. Um, how do you take this information and you kind of give it to <laughs> normal people's normal, as in quotes, uh, so that it becomes good news to them? Um, it seems like to understand this, you have to have a certain background, uh, of course. Um, so where would you, what would you say to give this class a point as far as going that direction, as far as being good news to people that may not have this background to? Well, we'll start out, first of all, by doing what uh, Jeff has been doing to our class for the last several years and that is recording it so that at least it's available. That's number one. <coughs> number two, it probably pays for those of us to talk to, who have the ability to talk to people around us about this kind of thing. Number three, um, the, uh, eventually I want to get to a book called Explore Evolution which was specifically designed intelligently <coughs> to be a supplement to standard biology textbooks uh, written in such a way that uh, the average biology student would be able to understand it. And that can simply be, uh, we should be having either that book or something like that in all of our Seventh-day Adventist schools probably it should be in, in every Christian school to enable people to have some of this information that the mainstream media, that even the mainstream scientific media don't give. Uh, and uh, I think that eventually it will reach enough of a critical mass to where most people will actually know about it. Um, and they'll realize that, for example, that we're 99% chimpanzee is a huge lie. Uh, yes, Sean. For non-biologists, though, I mean, there are ways to get these concepts across in common language without talking about biomolecules or any living thing. You can compare it to other things that everybody knows about. You can p compare it to physical objects like granite cubes, which I use all the time, or even the English language system or any other language system. Computer programs. Computer programs. It works for any kind of thing that normal people deal with on a daily basis. It's the same argument either way. I'm not, I don't know anything about the genome, basically, and I'm not a scientist in any stretch of the imagination, but I could rather 
well understand John Sandsford's book, even though it was technical language, because you could understand the principles that he and the points he's making very easily. Just take the time to read. I'm now reading a book that I think you recommended to Phil called Evolution is Impossible. Can't remember the author. Oh, the uh, but it's, it's John Ashton's book. Excellent, yeah. yes. Excellent book. Fascinating. Yeah. I love it. The, the more of these books we have, the more of them, uh, and, and the more of them that deal with it on a basis that reacts to what people are being taught at the time they're being taught. Uh, and I think there's very little excuse for Loma Linda Academy not to have, if not some other book of the same kind. At least they should all have the Explore Evolution written by the Discovery Institute. And uh, that's one of the books that I kind of have lined up to, to go through because I think it would be worth our while to look and see what's available. And also for those of us who have the influence to be able to lobby for that kind of stuff being done, I think it makes a huge difference when people realize that the science is in fact on our side. Anyway, next week we will continue, uh, God willing, and um, uh, we're going to discuss the, the, all those bones of humans and humanoids that you've heard about. We'll go into uh, Neanderthal and, uh, and the shape of the skull and all that stuff.